The right set of wheels can completely transform your ride, from the synergy between your tyre, your rim and your hub, matching your riding style exactly. So what should you look for to find the perfect wheel set? Form follows function is a minimalist mantra and it's got its roots in Bauhaus design, so have a Google if you want. A mountain bike wheel is a perfect example of this. Everything is optimised to work efficiently and as a system together. And so subtle optimizations in rim size or spoke count or hub design will mean that the overall package will be much better than the sum of its parts. We're comparing cross-country, XC and enduro wheels. Now these two genres of riding, or styles of racing even, are at the polar opposites of the mountain bike world. Cross-country is all about pedaling efficiency and minimal weight. So we need a wheel that can transfer that power and cope with rougher, tougher courses of today. Whereas an enduro wheel is all about durability for back-to-back -back runs on really gnarly downhill tracks, whilst also being light enough to spin up. It's all about balancing these differing performance qualities to find the perfect balance for where you ride. The wheel designers just have three elements to play with, the rim, the spokes, and the hub. And the interplay between all these parts can make a product that's greater than just the sum of the individual parts. Let's find out how. We're going to start with spokes because these help tie an understanding of how all these key elements work together. Now spokes can be made from steel or aluminium alloy or carbon, heck even string, but all of the different materials are going to work in a similar way and that's a bit like a spring. A spring, yep! Jobs Brandt, the Uber engineer who worked at places like Porsche and Ritchie, um, he helped develop a new understanding of how the wheel works and Effectively, the bike is actually hanging from the spokes versus being under compression. So that means the spoke is a bit like a spring under tension. Well, roughly speaking. There's a long legacy of spokes being steel, and that's because steel's got really good properties for the application in a wheel. It's strong, it's fairly light, it's very durable, it's quite tough, it's got good elastic properties, so that means it's good for that hub supporting the rest of the, the wheel. Um, it's also resistant to fatigue, which is great if you want to have a wheel set that's going to last a long time. All of these properties mean that steel is still real in making a really good wheel set. Different spokes are able to handle different amounts of tension, and that will depend on the wheel system design. The gold standard of steel spokes is the flat bladed spokes, uh, and that's because, well, bit of history. They were originally designed for marginal aero gains. Now, we're not doing it marginal gains on a mountain bike. We're using them for their physical properties, and that means they can hold tension a little bit higher, and also the physical property that they're flat. And this means that they're less likely to get affected by nicks or cuts or damage from trail detritus or your chain, because they're physically flatter, so they're not going to get caught. Whilst discussing spokes, we need to talk about spoke count and spoke pattern. So, spoke count first. Essentially, if you think of it like a bridge and with pillars in a bridge, if you've got more spokes, that means the bridge, the rim, is much more supported. So, potentially, you'll get a stiffer rim. So, conversely, if you've got less spokes, you'll probably have a less supported rim and the overall ride could be a little bit more compliant. Spoke pattern can change for different applications on different wheels. And again, it's a really big topic. Essentially, when you cross the spokes over, two cross or three cross, you'll see them referred to, it provides more support laterally, and that means you can have a stronger wheel in certain directions. Finally, we need to discuss spoke tension. Now, spoke tension for the wheel system is going to be optimised for the rim and hub and the overall design. It used to be that we would have a, a sort of an analogy of a, a looser, lower tension wheel would be a more compliant ride. And conversely then, if you had a higher tension, it would be a stiffer and more dynamic ride and kind of there'd be more transfer and lots of things like this. Unfortunately, those rules don't really apply when you're making a wheel system, because if you had really low spoke tension, well, you'll just load the rim and that could damage. If you had really high spoke tension, well, you also might load the rim too much, and you also might damage the hub. So most wheel systems will have a defined window for where that spoke is gonna operate in its optimized manner. Things have settled down in the mountain bike world, so 29 it 
wheels are the most popular for most applications, especially XC. 275 or 650B is still there for gravity riders uh, looking for a slightly more robust wheel. But actually, most riders could also look at this for a mixed wheel size as well. So running a 29er up front and a 650 rear, it does give you a little bit more crotch clearance. Diameter aside, there's some other rim sizes that can be optimized for different applications. And the first one of those is inner rim width. Now, inner rim width plays specifically to what size tires you're gonna have. So, a uh, wider inner rim width can support a larger tire, and conversely, a narrower profile will suit a narrower tire. So, often, XC races are using narrower tires than Enduro races. So, you'll often see XC wheels have a narrow inner width profile compared to Enduro ones. Some XC races like to run a narrower rear tire, and some wheel manufacturers like to match this too. So you'll often see a wider profile up front and a narrower rear profile. Again, this is just of the inner rim width because that's the factor that plays with how your tire sits and what profile it will be. Overall rim width, this can flag sidewall thickness. Thicker sidewalls of the rim can, whilst offering a little bit more mass, can offer a lot more strength and durability to the critical bead area of a rim. So for an enduro racer, having this extra support is really critical. Some well-designed systems can actually reduce pinch flats as well because this sharper edge is actually softened and it spreads the load out a little bit more. Rim depth. With aluminium alloy, this used to be a really good indicator of how stiff a wheel would feel. So, in short, a deeper rim would be stiffer and a shallower rim would be much more compliant. Those rules have been pretty much kicked out with carbon fiber due to the way that carbon can be laid up and there's some really clever wizardry, which we'll go into a little bit more detail later. Essentially, rim depth doesn't make as much impact to ride quality as it used to. Wheels by their very nature are asymmetric. So if you're designing a whole wheel system as a package, if you're able to offset the rim, even by a little bit, just a subtle amount, it can help offset some of that asymmetry and build in more durability into the wheel by helping support the spokes and the hub and the rim all together. A good analogy of this would be that you're putting in a asymmetric input into the wheel, but you want a symmetrical output. Finally, a dedicated tubeless ready rim profile will ease tubeless setup considerably. The best designs only need, depending on tire, just a floor pump to set up. For a long time, aluminium alloy was the only option for mountain bike rims. And that was okay, they were good enough, they were light enough, but they could fatigue over time and dent. And due to metallurgical constraints, we were limited to optimizational options. So, for the ultimate in rim optimization, carbon is king. Why is a good carbon rim so good? Well, it's a really deep topic, but in short, with carbon fiber, you can create a structure that's anisotropic versus isotropic. And what does that mean, you ask? Well, an isotropic structure means that the material's properties are the same all over in all directions, roughly speaking. Ansotropic means that you can tailor some of those properties to be different in different directions, which is pretty much perfect for a rim because it's going to have different loading requirements in different directions. So with carbon, we can tailor this optimization to the ultimate degree. The stuff that's been laid up by hand, like, like it is in these Reynolds, offers near additive manufacturing levels of optimization. The individual sections or plies of carbon are laid up, aka the layup, in a different orientation and different order. And the precision of this process and where those layers are means that the carbon can do its engineering wizardry. Often, looking at the profile won't be enough to reveal the properties. And that's because of this unique layup of the materials inside. And also, we talk about carbon and, well, that stuff hasn't really changed. I mean, elementally, it is just carbon. What has changed is the resins that flow with the carbon fiber. So the resin makes up about a third of the weight of any carbon part, and these have changed radically over time. Uh, these new resins like Reynolds IDM, so that's impact dispersing matrix, mean that carbon wheels especially can really deliver on the bold promises. Pulling this all together is the hub. This is where the spokes lace in and pull the rim and hub all together to make a wheel. Traditionally, we had J-bend spokes and a sort of newer development is the direct pull. So a J-bend spoke, as the name 
gives away has got a little bend at the bottom where it laces into the hub. Um, this is sort of on the side of the hub, whereas a direct pull has a sort of hole and slot in the top of the hub, if that makes sense. For a long time, people thought that a direct pull spoke was stronger than a J-Bend, but the science gets a little hazy and you can make great wheels from both. What's great now is that you can get direct pull and J-Bend spokes readily available everywhere. So there's no sort of like issues of sourcing parts where sometimes there used to be in the past. Whilst there's still a few holdout brands that are using cup and cone bearings, which, okay, if adjusted properly and lubed correctly, can provide a marginal gain of cornering efficiency, high quality cartridge bearings that are lubed and filled correctly are the best option. High quality cartridge bearings are easy and simple to replace, but there's always room for improvement, so chunky dust or mud seals also help keep out the crap. Most high-end wheel brands will offer the three main freehub bodies, so HG, XD, and Microspline. And some hub brands offer uber high engagement, which is a boon for racers because they can get that efficiency straight from the off. They also sound amazing. Think again as your wheels is the first part of your suspension system, although unlike your suspension forks or your rear shock, they're not moving just in one lateral path. Wheels can offer lateral compliance and vertical compliance too. If we continue with the suspension analogy, a stiff wheel can be really good for pedaling inputs and a really direct feel, but it's going to come at the cost of smoothness. This makes a real difference to how the bike tracks, especially on off cambers. I found a really stiff wheel really struggles to get grip because it's sort of pinging across the surface. Whilst early carbon wheels were really stiff, which was great for cross country races as they needed that directness, they were often brutally stiff, too stiff for enduro racers and all day riders as they'd transmit all the bumps and shocks and it would get really tiring riding a stiff wheel. But now wheels can be compliant and durable, light and strong. This compliance isn't at the expense of strength either because lots of the top brands offer lifetime warranties on their wheels. There's a lot going on, even with a simple wheel, but hopefully by understanding all the elements that pull together to create a great wheel, you'll be able to select the right wheel for where and what terrain you ride. Hopefully this video has been useful. If you want me to do a deep dive into more sections of the bike, maybe suspension, let us know in the comments below.